Enter the Bath Mayo Experience. Bath Mayo Experience. Bath Mayo Experience. Bath Mayo Experience. Experience. Welcome. To the Pat Mayo Experience, presented by DraftKings 2022 Charles Schwab Challenge, DraftKings picks and preview and play the best plays. Reminder to smash the like button for the episode. And in the 6K range, you tell me your favorite, then put it in the comment section. All right? Listeners League only has 2,000 spots this week because we were late getting it out. No research show because I had lost my voice on the weekend. And as you can hear, it's not all the way back as of yet. So we decided to make it a bit smaller, and demand is now through the roof. So if there's any spots left as you are watching this, go play in it right now. Link in the description. Tyler Tambellini at Totec and Tampa. We are not doing the live chat on Wednesday. We do have a strategy show coming out on Wednesday with me, you, and Ben Raza about DraftKings Golf. But for the Charles Schwab, actually, let's revert back to the PGA Championship. Um, I was doing a Cut Sweat live show on Friday night, and you won 100K. We were sweating it live on the show. You weren't there because that would have been probably too much to sweat, huh? It was a lot going on. You texted me and I was like, yeah, I'm definitely sweating this, but I was getting the kids down to bed. It was a, you know, a long day of watching it and it was really scary. I needed some crazy stuff to happen at the very end. It was my guy, Cam Young, my new guy. I'm calling him my guy now that came through for me. And when he went, like everyone was hitting that green on 18, the conditions were prime for it. He goes off into the short rough. I'm sweating it on like three different apps, trying to see which one's going to update the fastest. And then of course, you know, it goes live and I see him chip it to four feet, five feet. And yeah, he made the putt for me. It sort of just sunk in the left side, ended up getting first and second. So it was an $85,000 swing for 125K day overall. Very, very nice way to start the weekend. That's for sure. For sure. When I was looking at all the like different combinations of, I started scrolling back. It's like, who can catch him? You actually had the most guys remaining with the lineup that I think ended up coming in second. The one thing that I neglected to realize was Cam Young didn't have a bogey all day. I, I just totally spaced on you getting those extra five bonus points for the bogey free round. I was like, oh, this is just going to lock it in. This is great. It was required. That's the crazy part about it. So you you mentioned it. The other lineup was nice. It had Bubba and Answer, but they did no scoring down the stretch. Both had Cam Young, but I realized this too, that so did uh, you know, the closest that I needed to him pass was he had to get the bogey-free bonus because the par was not going to be enough. So, oh, well, the par gave the bonus. The bogey would have lost it, and I would have came in uh, second and third, which was an $85,000 swing. That's insane. Well, congratulations to you. You I mean, you were giving out the you. plays on Mayo Media Network on Thursday yeah. evening for the showdown show. You didn't deviate from that. So if the people watch, I feel like they did pretty well too. They, I think so. And they should be watching. You just said it. I'll, I'll make just two quick comments on that because one, it is on the Mayo Media Network. You can go back and see it there. Talk the exact player pool, the exact strategy of using the PM guys only. Uh, pretty much everything broke it down on how I was going to do it. And then the other part was, I just thought this was sort of the irony. It was funny as we looked up the payout structure live and we just talked about how much of a swing it was. And I was like, oh, some poor soul is going to lose 75 grand when he cut, when he drops from first to second in the last hole. And sure enough, it was actually worse. Uh, <laughs> dropped 85 K and it sucks. It happens. Uh, Mito Pereira style, maybe if you will, of the very last you know shot of the day can affect you in that way. And I tweeted about that today. It's, you know, it sucks, but it happens in daily fantasy as well. We spoke about the wave shifts and the weather on the Wednesday live show and trying to figure out the best way to game that. We decided AM, PM was going to be the way that we wanted to go because it especially looked bad and you use this to your advantage to win the 100,000 bucks or 125,000 bucks that the morning on Friday was going to be the worst of it. That if you could just avoid that, you would be pretty good. Now we tried to do that at the Players Championship and then the play got delayed and then they got pushed today. And then all of a sudden the guys that were supposed to get the good times got the bad times and vice versa. And I thought that people would be scared off of doing the weather stack again, but our, our buddy sky put out all the splits for everything. And the AM PM was what? 8% of lineups in the millionaire maker. Yeah. In the $25 millionaire maker, it was 8% in the 4444, like a mega high stakes one. It jumped up quite a bit. I think it was almost 29% that people just got behind it with the most money on the line, or maybe they'd won it from a ticket or whatever that they got in. They just didn't want to risk it beyond that. But yeah, 8% up from 6% at the players when we went for it last time. So I was shocked that more people weren't deterred because it didn't work at the players. And we talked through it, like stuff happens, but you're still trying to put yourself into the best position to succeed. And as we were speaking about before the show, Justin Thomas winning coming from the other wave kind of skewed the results. But if we're just talking straight up six of six percentages to give yourself a chance, uh, there was no better way to construct your teams than AMPM. 
yeah, it absolutely crushed in that manner. Of course, everyone's going to have their opinions on it. I, I won't go too long winded to get other shows coming up this week, but just final comments. I think one, you don't know what, ha- you can't control what happens going in. You can't control what happens going over the weekend. Uh, you put your lineups in based on the best strategy you've got. We had it. We weren't deterred by it. I would argue that 8% up from six is still horrible. Like it should have been a lot more. The wave advantage looked strong. People just are not committing to it. They had to sprinkle their guys. And guess what? They still sprinkled 20% Cantlay and 15% Connors and guys like that that just didn't even make the cut or work out. And there was also plenty of guys to be had on the AM side. I heard one argument out there about, oh, but 14 of the top highest 17 were, were AM guys. So that means the strategy's moot point or whatever. It's not. There was 75 guys in that wave. Even if you want to say 30 to 40 were playable, it's probably closer to 40. There was plenty of leverage opportunities. Harmon, uh, Davis, Riley, guys Hatton. like that, instead of a, a Norin, you, you mentioned, yeah, him. Like there was a lot of ways to get different, even within the wave stack. And of course, you know, anyone who's doing it now, it's going to be results oriented. JT came back and won. If you flip JT and Rory's score, you can't do that because it's not what happened. My point is just to explain, you don't, you also can't control the JT came back from seven strokes and one, but if you flip their scores, every lineup in the top, even in the $25 becomes a AM only with six guys from the AM. So I, I want 50%, six of six odds when I'm going in, when only 8% of the field is stacking, you get a very nice floor combo of being able to cash all those. And if you didn't build them with six straight chalk guys, then you were able to still find leverage up to the top. I believe if you flipped Rory with JT, I was talking to Sky today, actually, uh, it was still a unique lineup that used Chris Kirk at 6,900 at like 2% that would have beat the seven man sort of, uh, you know, duped lineup that would have came in and it was sort of up at the top, even with JT winning. So it's the way it goes, Pat, but we don't, we're looking for edges going in. We can't be based off the results that JT won. You guys were wrong. I hope people think that. I love it. We'll continue to play the way we do and continue to make money doing it. So I'm excited for the future. And it's not going to work out every time. We just experienced that at Sawgrass, that it doesn't go directly to script like this. We're going to get to the U.S. Open. Or hell, we're going to get to the Open Championship where who knows, like the wind can turn on a dime there, that maybe the reverse stack is something you need to start considering. But it's nice when it works out and you really hammer down on it, you get to cash your money out of it. And even as you said, like Justin Thomas wasn't in the winning lineup and a lot of high stake stuff because the AM PM smashed so much. If you had Justin Thomas... Chances are you didn't, I mean, obviously you didn't go full on AM PM stack that you probably had too many other PM AM guys that ruined your lineup. Yeah, very, very much a possibility. I think one of the big takeaways too, for the higher stakes stuff, we talked about it on the Wednesday premium show at Rum Pure, but if you wanted to go like 5 AM guys at the bottom, because you're worried about the wave and that sort of thing. One of the ways to differentiate would have been to take your Rory and look, not everyone would have got to perfect JT that ended up working out. But if you wanted to play like a ROM, a Scotty or a JT, even a more cow, if you're a more cow guy, you could have went a one five, I would call it where you built with one of those guys because Rory was, you knew Rory was going to be so popular in the high stake stuff, especially he was the only guy in the top five with the AM. So I thought that was a pretty good strategy for high stakes that you could have ran and it could have shipped the bigger stuff. It just didn't because 30% of the field in something like the mega was so dedicated to this AM PM wave that it ended up not working out there, but it, it would have worked out if people had the right combination of it. So I like that for next time. And then just lastly, two seconds quick, but the, the players was different. That's the last thing I'll say. You and I did talk a little bit about that on Wednesday. The players had opportunity to get completely flipped. I don't think this had opportunity to flip. I just think you had opportunity to not get the two plus stroke advantage because in reality, it was a two stroke on paper, but I think it was actually more when you think about what the other wave had for talent with Rom, Scotty, Kawa, JT, Lowry, Fitz, all those guys we talked about. So either way, it's like you said, we're not always going to get it right, but you got to be, able, we're not going to know what's going on half these slates that we go into. So just try and play a strategy, stick to it, and maybe it'll go in your favor. Colonial is the host course for the Charles Schwab Challenge. It's just over 7,200 yards, a par 70. However, a lot of the yardage is baked into the par threes and one of the par fives. It's actually an incredibly short course with, I believe it's nine par fours under, under 450 yards. So any sort of skill set can compete. Here, you don't need to be long off the tee. Extra distance can only help, mind you, as long as you're not in the trees. But find your fairways. 
get it to your range and just make sure your irons are absolutely dialed in, have a pretty good week putting, and boom, you're going to find yourself inside the top 10. That's what we see every single year at Colonial. Plus, there's only 120 players in the field, it being an invitational, which is weird because it's called the Charles Schwab Challenge, not the invitational, but it still has the small field. I don't quite understand how that works. Either way, they're playing for the plaid jacket and like, million and a half bucks this week but because it's only 120 people a lot like the pga championship that we talked about last week that once you remove the pga professionals and some of like the scrub asian tour players from the field it's a pretty small field for top 70 in ties that's what it was last week this week it's top 65 in ties but it's only 120 players so a very high percentage of players are gonna get through the cut line more so than your average tournament so does that First of all, change your strategy of an invitational event versus something like the Byron Nelson, which was 156 players in top 65 in ties. Yeah, and I think there's actually a lot of guys in the 6K range that are very viable. I get, again, I know they're only known to us as darlings because we play them every week and we're doing the content and grinding in the streets 24-7 that we actually know who they are. But, Pat, you look in that 6K range, there's a lot of guys that I think you could play this week, and I'll definitely be doing so, taking a little bit more risk on in that sense because – like you said, shorter field. Other thing I want to just comment on, because it ties into what you just said, is this to me is a lazy week. You and I talked about the strategy a few weeks back, or maybe it's only uh, two or three weeks back now, but uh, a major hangover isn't just for the players, which will be talked about a lot on the content this week, like if JT plays or how does the guys that made the weekend deal with this. But I think from a DFS perspective, we're going to see a lot of very congested ownership, mostly leaning towards course history, I would imagine that people go to that angle. But in general, I think there's going to be a lot of things you could take advantage of this week more as the week goes on. I know we don't have a, a live show this week, but I think paying attention to ownership will be a big key here. Do you really think Colonial will be a lazy week? I, I This is one of my favorite tournaments of the year. Yeah, I, I think it's not about the field or the strength or how good the course is. It's all great stuff. You said it. I love this week too. But just from already seeing the stuff and just hearing people talk about it, that major takes a lot out of everybody, right? Like, so, you know, even I'm, I'm talking daily fantasy players. It may seem crazy, but to me, I follow everything quite a bit, as you know, and just being in the discords and being on Twitter 24 seven and all this stuff, you know, people are a little bit over it. They just had a, a huge event. They had a bunch of money at risk. It, whether they made money, lost money, whatever it might be, uh, it's kind of like gear up for the next one. So it won't be a dead event. Like people will be talking about doing their content. I'm just saying, I would imagine we see congested ownership by the time the week ends. And that to me is where the best, I think the best advantage lies uh, playing MME and things like that, where you can get advantages and edges that way. Well, continue to follow along with Tambo as he releases his Tambo tidbits on Wednesday, where he'll have a better grasp of a lot of the ownership. Because as we speak right now, it's going to be very difficult outside of like the very obvious plays. But like, oh yeah, that guy's going to be popular. That guy's going to be popular. But we're not deep enough into the week to see how that's matured as of yet. Let's get to the 10Ks. Scotty Scheffler, World number one, coming off an Ender-cursed week. And everyone in his group was Ender-cursed. Jeez, it was not great news for that entire group. But he's 11-2. He is not the betting favorite. The winner last week, Justin Thomas, who is somehow playing this week, is. He's 8-1, to $11,000 on DraftKings. Morikawa, Spieth, Zalatoris, Hovland round out the top 10. Spieth seems like such a lock play here. Yeah, he'll, he'll definitely be the most popular. That's for sure. Look you, at his course history. Are, are you sure coming off like a week where he was the most popular and kind of let people down? Yeah, uh, even more so. Like I said, I'm definitely <laughs> sure on that one. Like, it's just that people are done with that. We talked about it even last week. We, we did the, the whole Willie Zalatoris thing, and it was good. It almost worked out for him. But at 8,900, he was still – and, and he probably got a little more steam being in the right wave that everyone wanted to play and all of that. But people didn't care about the miscut at the Byron Nelson. It was the PGA Championship – Totally new reset, a new price, everything. Speed this fair price at 10-4 here. His history is incredible. Uh, cash game lineups will start with him, which leaks over into tournaments. And even the, the people that fade him, which I think is you know definitely an option here, there's lots of guys around him, will still leave him at 20% plus this week. I would say Morikawa is my second favorite of the 10 plus K guys. And maybe he is someone who can drive me. If Spieth is going to garner this much ownership, maybe we take a look at Morikawa, $300 more. He is not perceived to be on the level of Justin Thomas or Scotty Sheffield, the year's first two major winners, because, hey, we play with recency bias here. But he was just a shot out. Was he a shot out of the playoff or was he in the playoff the year that Berger won coming out of COVID? Anyway, he was. Mm. I think he was third that year. Yeah. But when you think about what he does well, 
this is what he does well. And it's a short course. He can use his irons to his advantage. He has to go out and make a few putts, but he doesn't put himself into a lot of danger, and he should give himself more scoring opportunities than anyone else. It's not a course where around the green or distance really makes that big of an like makes that big of a factor. It's mitigated here, and those are the two weaknesses. I mean, if they're weaknesses, they're they're less good than the elite part of Morikawa's game. A second and a 14th in his career in two starts at Colonial. I, I really like him here, and I can see him being overlooked. Yeah, was, wasn't it a playoff with Berger? I thought Xander was in it too. Maybe that's what I, I thought it was just those two guys because there was remember it was like two times in a row where they had these playoffs very close. It was a, you know, 2020. I can't remember that far back now, but either way. Yeah, I, I like your call there, Pat. I do like uh, the idea of Morikawa. The other guy I like, though, actually is down below him. We just, you know, we played him last week and you just mentioned it in your, your little notes there. Like, I think around the green is a little bit mitigated here. And so I'm willing to go back to Victor Hovland. I know it ended up not working out last week and it did turn out. But if you actually watch, because I had a lot of Hovland, I actually had him in my mega lineup. I, I used him up at the top with Cam Smith, which was hurtful, but I still cashed the lineup. And at the end of the day, his chipping wasn't as bad as you might think. There was a couple bad days in there, but if there were spots where he was just missing five foot, six foot putts. That was happening. And that's one of the things you need to get right at majors, especially ask Cam Smith about it. The other guy that I just mentioned. So Hovland, Morikawa, and actually Scheffler at the very top interests me most. I think, uh, you know, people will still play Scheffler. They'll, again, they're not going to forgive him, but if they are going to go to other guys there, obviously Justin Thomas, if he doesn't withdraw, which he hasn't yet, I think that uh, he'll probably be one of the lower owned here just because people won't ever go back to an expensive guy after coming off of a major win. It's just not a, th not a thing many do. It's funny. All the talk going into the week was how, you know, Hovland can't win because his around the green is too terrible. He gained strokes around the green. There you go, right? Can't do it. They said, I, yeah. I watched it. It was, it was painful. Obviously Cam Smith, like I said, much more painful, but uh, Hovland did miss a lot of six footers this past week and could have been in the mix at least somewhat, but it was never going to be as good as Rory for the hundred bucks more. And I loved Rory, but uh, once it got to the point that he was pushing 30 plus percent in the high stakes stuff, I liked squeezing out in between uh, him and Spieth and going with Hovland and Smith instead. And it just didn't work out. So for me, I think I'm looking at Spieth, Morikawa, Hovland as my one, two, three from this range. I mean, Will Z is right there. Tough to say, really, what he's going to be like at a tournament like this. Yeah, one thing I'll say on Willie Z, and he earned a little bit more of a fan of me of stuff yesterday. Obviously, he's good. Like, I always make fun of the guy for the numbers and stuff. And you can go bet him if you want at the 2023 PGA Championship now at like 25 to 1. So if you think that's a good number, <laughs> go ahead. I would definitely not be doing that. But the point would be more so. Uh, he grinded it out, man. He did what he could. He made the putt on 18. I, I definitely don't think he choked. But what, what I will say is obviously the Saturday of missing all those short putts, the, the tee shot that goes OB and he has to take the penalty stroke. Those are still mistakes that he'll learn from and get better and he'll come back and win. He's going to win at some point. I make fun of him because of the betting number. But one thing I will note, Pat, that's relevant to this week maybe is that at the Farmers, after the playoff loss, Pretty rough stretch after that. Mind you, tougher courses, but this is not an easy course. It's a, you know, a fairly decent score usually. It's not going to be a birdie fest or anything, but 26th at the Genesis, 38th at the Arnold Palmer, 26th at the Players. And one thing to note, very, like, the only tournament he's lost off the tee since like 2020 was the tournament after the tough playoff loss, tears in the eyes to Luke List. And even doing his interview last night, uh, very choked up and obviously and right rightfully so the guy wants to get the job done wants to win a major i think he will i, I got no problem with willie z as far as that's concerned i, I like i said you're new usually i'm making fun of him for like a 15 to 1 or a 20 to 1 number because he doesn't win 20 tournaments uh, one out of every 20 tournaments he just doesn't win ever so um that that's my rant on that but i, I don't think i'll go there this week based on that Nine Ks, and when you look at the sportsbook odds at DraftKings and you know just the DraftKings pricing, there is a significant drop off in talent, at least in my mind. Between like that, that threshold is a real threshold. Burns feels like kind of a tweener at ninety seven. Like he could be in between. Many will make the case that Max Homa is as well, but I think that Burns and Homa are so much closer to the next ten guys down the list than the guys above him. So it's Burns, Homa, answer M, Finau, Berger. I don't see how we don't use Burger at $9,000. That seems like a lock. And answer at $9,300. That feels like a great play as well. Those are my two guys. From the nines, I think I can leave out the rest. <laughs> that works well for me. Uh, those are the two guys that I bet this morning at 35 to 1. Uh, you know, at the top of the board, the rest are all pretty much bombs. But uh, answer, like you said, just showed it enough last week. I think it's the perfect setup 
for him. And then you, you talk about burger, he'll probably end up being popular. So for something like a single entry, higher stakes, thing like that, if you did want to make a pivot off him, I would understand. But at least as of right now, pretty much everything checks out. Obviously, being a former champion, not a problem. And then on top of the fact, uh, like I always say, it's not a it's not a weak field at all. Right? Like look at the top of the board. But I usually like him in a lesser strength field than like a major, like a U.S. Open or something. That's where you're going to get the 20th or 30th at a burger, where it may or may not be good enough, depending on the pricing. But something like this, I think it's more than fair at 9,000. So I think he's actually a, a pretty good play there uh, off the board, I guess would be Sammy Burns. If you think he can carry it over, he made uh, a lot of mistakes down the stretch at this past major, but I think just carrying over from the fact that he played last week, wasn't really, you know, emotionally into it because he didn't do it. He wasn't close to anything special, just sort of played his weekend out. I think this would be a good fit for him as well. And a guy that wins, we talk about this all the time. Just sometimes you got to bet on talent and bet on the guys that actually win golf tournaments. I think Sam Burns is interesting at 9,700 up near the top. I agree with you, but if I start liking too many guys in the 10Ks, I feel like I need to filter that out into the 9Ks a little bit. I do agree that yeah. Burns is probably the best player there, but I liked what I saw from Answer last week. That was very encouraging. It was, it was his best finish of the year, which is shocking to think. He had no top 30s before last week. So hopefully whatever was plaguing him, the injury, just the poor play, that's you know, in the rear view mirror. He can get back at a course where he should excel pretty well. And then with Berger, like, I, I don't know if Pebble Beach is a direct corollary to this course, but we've seen a lot of the same guys do well. It's an old, historical, classic course, pretty short. The length is tied up in the par fives and par threes, and it's just a bunch of short par fours with small greens. Yeah. Yeah, I like him for that reason. And there's another guy Mad uh, that I like. Yeah, he'll be, I mean, he's probably going to be popular too, just based on all this stuff. But it is like a price that's too cheap at 7,500 when we get there later. And it's another guy that correlates to that thought process you're having. So don't hate that. Uh, last thing I'll say too, because you mentioned it, but just, at, you know, it's part of what you're saying too, Pat, comes down to strategy. Like if you are going to take on the risk, and you're fine with going to more of those guys down in the 6K range because it's an invitational type thing or challenge like you mentioned with only 120 guys, then I don't think you have to be as aggressive in this 9K range. But if you're willing to sort of mix it up and, and fade a bunch of those guys at the top, you know, if you go off of JT, who's not going to be owned, but Spieth and Zalatoris, I think you can definitely take on a little bit more like a Burns in this range. So I got no problem with it. Uh, looking at the early ownership from Fantasy National, and this is still way too early in the week. It just appears like no one is playing Zalatoris. Yeah, he'll be, I mean, that's one thing that I guess as much as I just said about him is he's a direct pivot off speed. If by the end of the week, you you think that nobody is going to play him again, we're doing this early. It's like a first look. Uh, he definitely rates out well for me. If that's the case, I just assume, like I said, people continue to go back to the guy, uh, especially like, you know, the, the narratives always get flipped both ways, but some will say what I said, there's no way he's going to, you know, have that round out after losing in the playoff again. Others will say that he was hungry in that interview. He said he's definitely going to get one. Maybe he's the guy that comes out and gets the job done here. So make that decision later in the week. But I can't imagine Hovland getting much ownership right there underneath him for 100 bucks less either. It, right. I mean, again, it's early. That does seem to be where the mouse is pointing, is right to Victor Hovland. And then Burns overlooked Homa and answer like Max Chalk. Yeah. And one thing I would say too, is we, it didn't work last week. You and I talked on the, the show with Raza. I love the, the Rory Kawa lineups. I was talking about with more Kawa and Rory together. They were new. It was more so because they were priced near the bottom of that 10 K range, something like way off the wall early on in the week. Just talking with you here, Zalatoris and Hovland lineup, maybe to start off. And then you skip the nine K and you skip the speed chalk with the guys above him. And you can still get very unique and, and not have to maybe dip down. I think that could be an interesting lineup construction that I'll make note of as we go here. 8Ks, the Gucci man is 8900 bucks. Fleetwood, now that he's good again, everyone's going to want to be on the Tommy train. 8800 Webb, Mito, Billy Horschel, Davis Riley, Bryson, who is still currently listed in the field at 8300 bucks. Kokrak, who's won this event. Nah, who's won this event. And then Bubba was $8,000. He has withdrawn from this tournament, which is... When I first released my, like, hey, here are the odds this week, so many people in my replies were like, man, got to bet Bubba, got to bet. What, what are people thinking here? A colonial? Yeah, uh, that's interesting to me. Obviously, he played well uh, at the, uh, I think it was what, Saturday when he had that really good round. I can't remember if it was Friday or Saturday. Friday. Friday, Friday it was because Saturday only Webb had the good special round there, which, uh, you know, is interesting too. But um, with, with him, that's probably the only thing people are leaning on. For me, it doesn't make any sense. And I'm kind of glad he withdrew just because it was already hard to sort of, 
wade through this area. So it just makes it a little bit easier for me there. Who stands out to you in the eights? I have Davis Riley and Kevin Na. I'm thinking about Webb. Yeah, Webb's going to be probably pretty popular. I know a lot of people rush to the window to at least bet him. But just going through the range for me right now, just looking at it like, um, you know, Mito, if people are he, like, he's the, the kind of like the Willie Z thing up top. People are definitely probably not going to play him. I get into it just a little bit on Twitter today. People talking back and forth about it. Like, what's your thoughts on this? We're not here to talk about this. But I said, it's a curiosity piece that goes with him at this price tag. Is he the next Molinari? That, that was what was being brought up. That's going to ruin him for life, that tee shot. What do you think? No, I don't think so. I think he's too young. And part of the Molinari stuff, too, is he was a major winner. He had won the British version of the Players' Championship, the BNW Championship. Like, he was an established player who had been inside the top 50 in the world for years. He'd been on multiple Ryder Cup teams. Mito's, what, like 23? I think he's 27. Is, he, yeah. is he really 27? I'm, I'm almost positive because I was looking it up the other day because uh, I was hoping Cameron Young won. I'm obviously a big fan of that guy now <laughs> for life. And uh, I looked it up. Yeah, Mito's 27, but... Either way, that was the, you know, that was sort of my point. And, and I also don't get like the Molinari thing. Of course, the guy fell off the map and had been on fire. But at the same time, that me to me, yesterday's, what if you want to call it a Mito meltdown, like people are calling it, it's one shot. It was bad for sure. But I, I think that was way worse. Like Molinari, it went bad earlier in the round. It wasn't the last tee shot that you just need to make one thing happen and you win. He also had, uh, I called them certified killers, but remember the stack of guys that were behind him chasing him. That was a real pack of wolves that you wanted to avoid. Here was like Willie Z and JT obviously are in the clubhouse. You know that, but to start the day and how well he played down to get to that hole, it wasn't like he was battling off the world. So uh, I don't think he'll, he'll fall apart from that. I got no problem. I kind of, I love Riley. You and I talk about him nonstop. I actually played him in my mega last week at 3% ownership. He was in the wave stack that we liked. I knew nobody was going to be on him. Uh, the Noren ownership was getting heavier as the week went on. And I like Riley's talent. And I just think the books don't account for it. Kokrak might be popular, but between him and Nah, I would probably still play him, even though people like Nah here. Nah. I always have in the past. You want to play Kevin. You want, you want to play Kevin Nah. That's who you want to play. It's definitely the spot for him. And obviously the history shows that quite well, but I, I think Kokrak, the history is there too. So I just think that's more interesting to me that I, I like Kokrak more than not nah, personally if you want to bet one of them you know go for it but uh horschel mito riley uh, basically the bottom of the board i'm not in love with that and i don't think i'm chasing the tommy fleetwood regardless of his ownership which could be could be lower still but uh, he had himself a really nice sunday that i liked i don't know if i would chase that into here too much for, you know for me i think the low ownership is going to fall on mito or horschel i think that's that's the pairing that people are going to skip and i like both actually yeah okay Seven Ks. Talk about those jabronis. Oh, there's Chris Kirk. I'm playing him. There's Gary Woodland. I'll play him. Brian Herman. I have a lot of interest there. This isn't good that I like so many guys in the seven Ks to start this off. Help me. Oh, this range is packed, man. That's why I set up above. Like, I, I don't mind it as much. And I think the six Ks are very playable, but it's going to be, you know, you still got to weed through it all. And for this range, for me, like you mentioned the ones at the top, Chris Kirk, who I bet already at 55. Uh, I like him. I like Harmon. I don't like Woodland as much, actually. I know he'll get some love this week, but I, I prefer the guys below him. I like Harold Varner. Uh, I'm, all, I'm always a big HV3 guy, and I think this would be a good spot for him. So go to him there. Tom Hoagie, I have interest in. McNeely, who I mentioned earlier. That sort of rounds up the upper 7K range. Is there, is there other guys that you like in there? No, not really. Those, those were the guys. Uh, I mean, Matt McNeely, like you mentioned. Hoagie is probably my strongest lean, but I think that... Anyone who runs any sort of stat model is going to see Tom Hoagie just leap off the page versus everyone else who's around him. Yeah, I think so too. Uh, with that being said, what do you think about Munoz? Because obviously, you know, last week didn't have a lot of love. Like people played him because he was in the good wave and he was cheap at 6,800, but uh, he's right there too. Do, do you have any thoughts on Munoz? Is like, is this a better setup for him or can he bounce back? Or do you even care about the guys that played last week versus this week? Because there's the Maxwell design that people will talk about. So obviously that comes across the bent greens similar, but this should be an easier setup. But do you care about any of that stuff from last week to this week? Not really. I like, it's good that Munoz played well. If Munoz had played poorly, then it wouldn't be like, Oh, can't play Sebastian Munoz. The guy has shitty yeah. tournaments all the time. Uh, just one offs then rebounds. Fine. He was great two weeks ago. He was okay. Last week. I think he's a good price. It's just, there's too many guys at the top here. I don't know what to do in the upper sevens. Like I said, Kirk Woodland, Herman Munoz, 
Hoagie, McNeely. You can make a pretty compelling case for Justin Rose being a former winner and what we saw out of him last week. He did everything besides drive the ball well. Yeah. I said day one, it must be a major Justin Rose chipping in, holding out everything, like just putting his light, the lights out. And then he, he came through, like you said, the rest of the week, it wasn't too bad. So uh, definitely a contrarian play there. If you go with him, one of the things, like I said, though, if, you, if you've got three guys at the top, two guys in the nine K range, three guys there, two to three guys in the eight K range, you can definitely pepper like 15 guys in this range. Even if you are trying to run like a 30 man, smaller player player pool, we talk about it all the time. And I, I think, that's where you can get aggressive with some of these guys, but I don't love Rose as much as that. Like it would be contrarian, but I'll go down. Like I like CT pan. I, I still think he's a good play. Uh, what do you think on Fowler? Fowler showed some, man, showed some stuff last week, man. He had a lot to prove to try and gain as many points as possible. Do you think he could come out with another good week here? Uh, how many times did he chip in last week? Four, five, a couple, at least Cu- couple, at least. Yeah. No, no. Thank you on Ricky. See, uh, yeah, he's not going to rate out well, but again, if it's just a feel thing, if you think he's coming into it, then I could do that. But the one you're, guy I like, a you're, lot more hold than on, hold on, you're worse than Feinberg. Listen to you, Ricky Fowler. It, he he really showed some. I played him on Sunday Showdown. He looked good. That's back to back top twenty five finishes, including one of them being a major. Was solid across the board. You got the stats for last week. You can see them right there on fantasynational.com slash mail, like you like to say. Everything but the putter, man. It was all good stats. And like you said, if you, you just talked about it with Munoz coming across, people just don't like to pay, play Ricky Fowler anymore. So uh, I got no problem playing some this week as a contrarian play in there. I think he's interesting. Well, I was going to say, though, the guy underneath them, I, I like a little bit more. He'll pick up steam when people find this out, but I don't know if you follow it. The, uh, the U.S. Open qualifiers. So uh, first off, I already like Matthew Neesmith on courses like this. Just hit fairways, position yourself, smaller greens. We've talked about them at RBC Heritage, places like that. They could be compared a little bit, uh, smaller greens for the putter, all these factors. And then he goes out and shoots a 62 today to auto qualify for the U S open. And now he's you know sitting here at 7,300. And it looks like because the way people value betting odds and things like that, Troy Merritt is at 7,300 as well. And maybe more will play him. So uh, I bet Merritt at a hundred to one. And then I see this with Neesmith. So I went back and circled back and bet Neesmith at 125 to start the week. Okay. Yeah, I saw on DraftKings Sportsbook, Merritt opened at 50. which They, blew- they think he's like the second coming of something. I don't know. They'll never put him at higher than that. It's crazy. All right. Well, the other guys who rate it well for me, like I was thinking about, and Feinberg had brought up Stuart Sink to me. I felt like last week was way more of a Stuart Sink type jam than this week. Although Heritage is a good crossover, if you're going to look at yeah. it. We've just seen a lot of similar. To, and it's you. I don't know if it's a... It's not that it's a similar type of course. It's it's shorter. It's smaller green. So that tracks. But one of the big things besides having, you know, one's a tartan jacket, one's a plaid jacket, you win the jacket slam. That's always that nice. Too. Like they're shorter courses so more people can compete. But you get similar winners and similar leaderboards. That usually was because the tournaments had very similar fields. Like you wouldn't get your top end guys at one or the other. You'd get one or two. But this feels like a really strong field. It definitely feels stronger than normal. I agree with you there. That's what I was saying earlier with Berger. It's not quite as strong, so I could see him doing – that's why he does better in it. It's, it's definitely stronger than what, what we would usually see, I think. But, uh, you know, the sink one's interesting because it correlates across. The field strength, like you mentioned, is a factor. But uh, I, I don't love many more of these guys at that seven to $7,200 range. Like, who, who else stands out to you there? Cam, there's Cam Davis, Ian Poulter, Lashley. JJ Spawn. Any of those guys? Nate Lashley. James Hahn. I d- I do it, but the voice is just it's still not good enough right now. Don't don't do it. No, don't don't push yourself there. And who knows who's gonna be eating chips at the golf course at any given moment. We don't know exactly with <laughs> James Hahn, but he looked better last time out after the chip incident. I kind of like JJ Spawn at 7100. He'll pop a little bit in the stats, but people won't probably play him. And then maybe, I don't know, Matt Jones, another guy that just would come to mind for that, like just sort of setting himself up, but he hasn't been great lately. Uh, but last time playing in in here in Texas, at least in Valero, uh, second place. Every time I play Matt Jones, he is the absolute stone worst. And every time I don't <laughs> play, he becomes in second place. He's just that guy for me now. I, I don't think this is a week where people play him. So at least you'd be on the right side of uh, the ownership, probably. So you could go go that route. But uh, I like the Lashley call too. I think that one's kind of interesting, and that would sort of round out the range for me. 
Yeah, I, I just I can't see myself getting to too many of these guys. I want to do a deeper dive on Cam Davis. If Cameron Young is your guy, obviously, Cam Davis did win me some decent amount of monies this week by going birdie birdie on the 35th and 36th hole to sneak through the cut line, which it wasn't much on the weekend, but it was enough, put it that way. You know where Cam Davis came at the RBC Heritage? We just brought it up. I'm just saying it now because, like you said, it's not even close. But at the same time, I do like the thought of the shorter course, the smaller greens, and mainly the mindset, like the, the positional setup. You can't just get it in the fairway there. You you want to, but I'm saying you also have to get it in the right. They talk about it all the time. All the quotes, get it in the right spot of the fairway. And you can say a lot for this course as well. You want to kind of, like, guys are clubbing down here. You just want to put it in the spot you want it to be in for your best club or your best range. And that's why I struggle with, you know, stats wise this week. I'll talk more tonight with Kenny on the fantasy golf degenerates podcast, but like people bring up these buckets like, Oh, 175 to 200 and 150. But these guys are setting themselves up in different places. Like they could club down completely and be in the, the longer range. Cause that's what suits them better on a certain given hole. But Cam Davis, by the way, third, at the RBC Heritage, most recently, where Spieth won in the playoff against Cantlay. People love Spieth here this week, so may maybe that's something to correlate up with it. I kind of like the Cam Davis call the more I look at it. I mean, I don't even really like it all that much, but I think you sold me on it, so maybe Cam Davis, throw him into a few lineups. And people liked him a little bit last week, right? He wasn't popular, I'm just saying, but people were talking about him before everything all came to fruition in the end, and ownership shook out a little bit different than you might have thought, but he was still used, and I saw people using him in Showdown, and round four and all, all those sorts of things. So I think it's a good way to find a guy that's different within a range. That's probably popular. Like I say, seven K's will be utilized quite heavily here. And we'll, we'll talk about the sixes. There's definitely viable plays, but I think it's a guy you could get different with in the sevens. Cam Davis. Who are we thinking about when it comes to the bigger disappointment from the PGA championship? Was it Alex Noren as the super chalky seven K guy who misses the cut after having a very good round? on Thursday, or is it Robert McIntyre who made the cut and I think scored negative points on the weekend? Gosh, <laughs> both were hurtful. Um, pro probably Norin, but I, I would say too, in hindsight, I actually loved him as a play. I used him as a core play for the week. So I was completely wrong. Take the L on that one. But uh, in general, you could just sense that he was getting all the ownership as the weekend went on. The challenge was everyone saying before, again, this is how it gets so results oriented. So going into the weekend after Norin misses the cut, anyone who didn't have him together with Bobby Mack was saying, oh, I should have just played Bobby Mack. And what were they saying by Saturday night? Holy shit. Well, this guy even outscored Norrin who missed the cut. And in the end he did, I think it was 31 to 20, but it wasn't the, the difference. And you and I talked about that on the Wednesday show was about, don't forget these guys still have to score for you over the weekend. You need four full days of guys that can grind for you. And the guys that played, Hoagie or Kirk or Fleetwood or answer or guys like that. They just grinded out a number without really scoring, but they had position points and they did. Ha they didn't have all the bogeys or double bogeys or worse to go with it. $6,000 range. Once again, playing the Pat Mayo experience DraftKings the listeners league link down in the description and in the comment section, leave your favorite play from down in the 6k range. Numbers would suggest two of my favorites this week. It's 64 and 63. They're 64 and 6,300. Good God. It's cheap. Kitayama and Smotherman both look really good. Yeah. they're go Hey, we might see one of the first weeks all season where we actually get uh, Super Chalk in a 6K range. We haven't seen that too often this year. If I, I can't remember exactly, but uh, it used to always be the thing, right? Like, you don't play the 6K Super Chalk guy because for good reason. There's like 20, 30 guys around him that are basically the same thing if you take out all the narratives and the stat models and everything that goes with it. But like you said, it's hard to avoid a guy like Smotherman at 6,300, like him quite a bit. The other guy that stood out to me, uh, probably not the best course fit if I just think about what his game is, but I don't care. And that's uh, Sahith Tagala. I'm just playing like, it's like a Davis Riley factor for me of just talent level versus price. It's not going to add up. You're going to look and see that it was just a horrible run of events that he's been on since his, well, I guess 24th at the Mexico Open, but who cares? Nothing special is there, but you're playing on a talent-based factor. So I like him. I like a guy like JT Poston. I think he can play well here. I think he's a good spot to go down to. Uh, Russell Knox, 6,900, shows up uh, over the last 50 rounds, at least for uh, greens and regulation, one, and then just good drives in general. He knows to position himself well. I think he's a guy at 6,900 that could be okay. And then I've, got, I've never really got a problem playing a guy like Denny McCarthy because he could just show up and putt, and putt the lights out and make everything. So I'll take some more chances down in this range. Glover? 
23rd yeah. last week. Top five in approach at the PGA Championship. Very sneakily. What's his price here? I'm trying to find him. 60, oh, 6,700. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I could go there. I was going to suggest even worse probably, but Jager bombs, Steven Jager, 6,800. He, he's another guy. Stats won't suggest it, but sixth at Wells Fargo, 15th in Mexico, 38th at the Byron Nelson approach game was solid at all of them. So I think, uh, and if he doesn't hit the greens again, it's a little bit mitigated here to your point earlier, but he has had good around the green game. He can make enough putts. I, I think this is a guy that we could play still at 6,800. So again, just talking about some of the guys down there that have talent, I probably like Glover better. And then your boy, Doug Gim is there as well. What, what are thoughts on him? I can't remember the last time the Gim Reaper played. Stats still love Doug Gim, but results yeah. do not love Doug Gim. Yeah, he missed the cut at the Wells Fargo. Obviously played, okay, 33rd and 35th, the Heritage and the Open, and then he came sixth at the players. So um, he's okay. I like Alex Smalley. By the way, he's another guy that basically looks like similar stats to Russell Knox, but is 6,700. And there's a bunch of guys there that we talked about, but those are just some that stand out for me. Uh, Grayson Sig got into the field today at 6,500. You usually talk about him. Do you like Do you like him? I mean, I only like him because his last name is Sig. Correct. But, but he, he, you, played, you know, he, he played well at Pebble Beach this year. Yeah, you brought that up earlier, so... I mean, before his recent do miss cuts, it was like four straight top 40s. Uh, again, that's kind of what you're getting out of a guy down here. I think we'll still need more upside than that, though. So uh, I would probably just, you know, eat the chalk at, at Smotherman. If he's not going to be super high on, if he's going to be 15%, it's easy just to go elsewhere. If he's going to be 8%, that's not chalk to me. I don't care if he's in the 6K range or not. You can make a decision. Get 20% and you're way overweight. But we'll have to wait and see how ownership shakes out down there. I know Nick Taylor got to bring up a good Canadian guy down here. Uh, he also looks to have qualified to the U S open today shot. Not quite. I think he shot a 65, but he looks good in the 13 spots available. I think he'll get a, a seat today. So good for him. And then not much else down the board. Svensson bring up another Canadian. Are we done with this guy or what? I don't know. You got to make a lot of putts to win this tournament. 26th at the heritage made the cut at Pebble beach. I, I don't know if you want to, play it from that angle. It is smaller greens. Usually it's ball striking. And that's why we go to him. And then the last guy I had Pat was a, a different Adam, Adam Shank, another AS at, uh, initials, Adam Shank, uh, 41st at the PGA championship, ninth at the Wells Fargo. I don't know. It's, he's, he's the stone minimum price, 6k even. He's another one who consistently hurts my feelings. I like Adam Shank, but I, I can't, I can't go there. I don't think you need to go down this low to be perfectly honest with you. Yeah, there, there's definitely that too. We we talked about it. And that's why I brought it up earlier. Like with that 7K range being so loaded, I definitely will likely have more of my lineups lean there. And then, you know, the upper 6K range, I have a lot more interest in from the guys that we mentioned versus going down. W one last guy. What about uh, Patton Kazire? Uh, you know, I'm sure you saw his little Instagram post there. It's, it's, it's always the guys that are playing like absolute shit that like to tell us that the course is overrated and it's a disaster and Hatton at the masters Kazire this past weekend, like everyone else played the same course and figured it out. You're basically DFL with Seb Straka and you're complaining. What, what's the issue there? And, and what do you think of that? I mean, he's been bad two tournaments in a row, despite making the cut. Like, it's just the wheels have completely come off. He's it's funny to go look at like Havlon and Morikawa from the PGA championship. They gained off the tee on approach around the green Lost on the greens. Because Iyer is the opposite. He lost off the tee, lost on his approaches, lost around the green, gained a little bit putty. He lost in all four at the Byron Nelson. That's tough to do at TPC Bunny Ranch. So I don't know where he's at. It usually was like, hey, Kazire in Texas, play Kazire. Easy stuff. I don't know. It's been a bad run for him. Yeah, the only thing I will say, I'm not in love with him right now, but just looking at plays down here, like he – makes a lot of cuts. So eight, eight of his last nine cuts, he's had success at some of the events like we talked about. So uh, interesting there. And then the other guy was just doing a little bit of a deeper dive on, don't see much, but Adam Long missed the cut at the Wells Fargo. But before that, it was 15th at the Mexico Open, 12th at RBC Heritage and 35th at Valero. He's right there at the 6,900 price point. Uh, looks pretty solid on par four scoring. Last 50 rounds, he's in 10th. And on the shorter par fours, which there's a lot of those as well, uh, even though basically he's really solid between the 350 to 450 par fours, which is like, what, 12 holes here? So uh, I think that's something to keep in mind as well. I do like Adam Long at 6,900 even. 
Yeah, someone who, like, in the shorter term, past 24 rounds, I brought up his name a little bit earlier, was Nate Lashley. Actually rates out really good in par four scoring. Do you know Dick Bland is in this field? He's 6600 bucks. Yeah, R- Richard Bland about to be banned because he said he doesn't care. He's going to the live tour. I, he doesn't. He doesn't care. Oh, listen, the dude's fifty. Let him go get that money. Uh, Rose still. Wrote, Rose still rates out really well in power four scoring. So and James Hahn once again the even seven thousand. He has back to back top tens. Yeah, I, I actually like the Hahn call. The more you look at it and bring that up, and he he will pop as a value. And typically, it's because of something like the jokes made earlier, the bad jokes made earlier of the chip eating. I think that people just end up not playing enough of him or care. They'll just say, ah, James Hahn, who cares? Even though he's got, like you said, two really good results and has been pressing, you sort of want to play him when he's a little bit streaky and he just won't be popular. It doesn't matter, right? What what people say is just not. I bet you brought it up. He actually does, like you said, pop really well. It's just to me, you know, and, and again, that's fine. Maybe I'll play him by the end of the week. I think just in general, because Hoagie could get really popular there. Maybe it's a pivot. But I think the stats look like Adam Long stats at 6,900. So if you need to save money or get get down from someone, you could do that. Not the same caliber in the least, not trying to compare. But I'm just saying when you're looking at the same type of stats, you have guys down below that can suit that mold. Let's play the best plays. Like we said, we were 2v2 away from the absolute nuts with this lineup last week. I played the lineup. It made like 3x in a GPP. Like If you had played that lineup in cash games, it was a 5 of stick, 6, and it's still absolutely crushed. It would have crushed in single entries as well. But yeah, not Fitzpat- Fitzpatrick instead of Connors was the play. And we even talked about that on the show. It was like, it, yeah. this is the 1v1 that we have. We went with Connors. That's before we knew the tees and the weather or anything like that. Just kind of blindly made a lineup. But when you have 1, 2, and 3 in your lineup, you're doing pretty well. Also, I forgot to look. I meant to look this up last night. I don't know if you remember. Did did Lanto outscore Fox? Oh, I he would have had to. I think Fox shot 95 on Sunday. Okay. Because uh oh, that's true. It was it was the first three rounds I was saying we were going in because we obviously talked about that going into the week and and I even thought that could be the build, right? Cuz you like Ryan Fox. So, uh, okay. J- Jordan Speed. I I know we could go backwards here with this play the best no, play lineup, play. but That's the play. Spieth you have is, to start with Jordan Spieth. So you start with Jordan Spieth. I completely agree. Burger. Really? Do you think that people are going to trust Burger now? Yeah. Okay. I would think. I, I don't know. Like, let me see here. Just one other thing I was trying to look at with Burger. So, yeah, he won, and that's about it. So I don't. We can leave him out for now. I may come back to him. Who? Who? Do, who's the other guy that you had that stood out right away? You were going to say Kirk. Yes, I like that. Seventy nine hundred. Yeah, plug him in. Hoagie, I think, gets there. Okay. Now we're looking at... Oh, man. Fantasy National projects Adam Long to have super ownership. That's hilarious. It's a, the, that's how you know it's early in the week and people are seeing the same things you're seeing. See, that's so crazy to me, though. That's that, why I always get confused. Like, it's not even about looking at Fantasy National. It's like you see other stuff and you just pay attention to it. He ends up popping and you think a guy like him won't be popular and then he still ends up somehow getting there by the end of the week um i i personally okay. do i personally do not think that he will get that I, there's no way he's above eight percent it's not happening so do you want to go kevin na we I mean, have eight thousand even average but like he's at 81 he's sort of the guy that i think there could make sense him or coke rack and you could go looking at this because i think that Harmon is going to be very high on people's radar so you go Harmon na coke rack that's the team. Spieth, Kokrak, Na, Herman, Hoagie, Kirk. Let me see it. Oh, yeah. That's it. That's what I was saying. Or I was just, yeah, you put it together the other way I was thinking. I was saying you could play both of them and see what happens, and it lands you on Herman. So I've got you. And also, um, this will be our 1v1 for this week is Kirk, or, or sorry, um, Harmon is the same price as Varner. And if you go last 50 rounds, like a lot of people use on fantasy national Varner pops quite well, he's 10th overall versus Harmon is 19th in my model, at least for what a lot of people will be looking at for the stats. So I love that lineup. And then you can play Harmon or HV three for the last spot. Or you could just drop down to Rose. Like if you use Rose in that lineup, not that I think there's going to be a super common build with one guy above 8,200 bucks, but put mm-hmm. inserting Rose into the Harmon spot leaves you a hundred on the table and fuck like it's, it's Rose. Like all these guys are yeah. basically the same. 
Oh, Rose can be exactly. That's what I was trying to say earlier. I don't love it as much, but can Rose beat Harmon? Can Rose beat HV3? Absolutely. Right. And, and what I do love about this, Pat, I talk about it sometimes. We talked a little bit about it on our strategy show that we did with Ben Raza there is if you look at the setup of this, well, it is a very popular Spieth lineup. And while a lot of these plays will hold ownership, at least somewhat, you are skipping the main guys at the top above. So you have no Scheffler, JT, Kawa, et cetera. You also are skipping the entire 9K range and the entire 6K range. So again, it's not really about who you're playing. It's about how you're playing. You can always get there with some chalk. Jordan Spieth might end up being one of the better chalk plays of the year because of the spot, his history, everything that goes with it, home game, all those factors. I love the setup of this build and just pick your poison for the last $7,800. Let's try to build another Spieth lineup. See how chalky this can get. Because I want to play Spieth, Answer, and Burger. I want to play all three of those guys in a lineup. That leaves me $7,100 remaining. That, I mean, would, I, I know that people are going to use this type of lineup too. Like three guys from up there. This one makes a lot of sense, right? Does that mean- but Now I think we put our boy Smotherman in though. That's what I was going to say. Like if you are going to use those three guys, can you use Smotherman if we do project him out around like eight, nine, 10%? Because he's such the logical play here. Like am I better off just using Kitayama at 64 I don't know if you're better off using him. We'll have, like, we'll have to wait and see how the week shakes out. I can tell you my early numbers on stuff because I calculate it all out usually. Uh, I would still have Smotherman unless you think the ownership's like double. I, th I think that it probably will be double, triple, or quadruple. So let's go Kitayama because definitely then it's Kitayama. What, what I was going to say too before we close it out because it's 74.50 average now when we go Kitayama is see how this is kind of like what I just talked about. It's the complete inverse of what we were doing before. So before we went 10K, two 8Ks, and three 7Ks. Now we're going the same 10K guy, but with two 9K and a 6K. And now we can do whatever we want for the last two spots. Two 7K guys, a 6K, and an 8K. Like there's a lot of ways you can take the construction and still make a Jordan Speeth lineup unique. Well, Matthew, okay, let's take Kitayama out for a second. Take Kitayama out and put in, you like Neesmith, right? I do like Neesmith, yes. So we'll throw in Neesmith. Lashley is right there, who rated out really well for me. And that leaves us 6,900. Your boy Adam Long is sitting there. Yaga, yeah. Yaga Bomb, Streelman, who we didn't talk about, McCarthy. Like, there's guys there you can do that you didn't need to go down that low. And even if you didn't want to use Neesmith, you can take Neesmith out, continue to use Lashley. Uh, James Hahn is right there at 7,000. That gives us 72. Play Cam, so, Cam, play Cam Davis, who we talked about. The other angle I was just looking at is if you leave Neesmith, because I did like him, and we stick with our original plan of Kitayama, yeah. it goes, instead of Neesmith, Lashley, Long, it goes Neesmith, Kitayama, Hoagie. Oh, that's much better. And I think that's better. So giving away all the lineups this week, get in a five max with us, because you'll need it all. You'll need 10 max. Obviously, fill the Lister League first, get in the three max. But then beyond that, uh, a lot of ways you can build this out here. But I do think these constructions, Pat, are still unique enough based on roster construction versus just, oh, but J Jordan Spieth's chalk. That's a de decision you'll have to make when it comes to like a higher stakes lineup or something where you can easily just make a pivot to the one of the guys around. It can still work in large field. I'm not saying that. My point is more there's ways to get different in large field if you still want to play Spieth. Some people's way of getting leverage on Spieth will just be to lock them in this week and build differently. Howard Tambellini, he, a much richer man than when we spoke on Wednesday. He will be on tomorrow's show with Ben Raza, breaking down DraftKings tournament selection, strategy, how to construct lineups, how to budget your bankroll, everything like that. Plus, you'll be on the Run Pure stuff on Mayo Media Network on Thursday, Run Pure Sports on Wednesday evening for the lineup lock show. But on Mayo Media Network, you and Kenny Kim are going to be talking about this very event on the Fantasy Golf Degenerates, correct? Yeah, we'll do the show tonight. Uh, should be out later this evening. You guys will be able to see it on YouTube, get it in all the places you get your podcasts and go through a little bit more. I haven't done a complete deep dive. This was obviously sort of first look like we always do play the best plays, end up being the best lineups and go from there. But we'll have a lot more in depth on tonight's podcast as well. Now, people should know that, yes, we recorded this before Fantasy Golf Degenerates. This isn't coming out till Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. That solves that. So now, you know, but go back and listen to it then if that's the case. There we are. So thank you all for watching, playing the Listener's League. Smash the like on the way out. And thank you all for watching. I'm Pat Mayo. I'll see you next time. Experience. Experience.